Lynn Halden is a macroeconomist and investment strategist. In this video, she discusses the challenges of explaining the upcoming financial challenges to friends and family in the context of the need to rethink governance in a digital world to prevent excessive government control. The system of checks and balances in the United States has broken down, with laws now being made through federal agencies instead of Congress. These agencies are often not accountable to the American people. Lynn talked about the correlation between the breakdown in the financial system and increased government control. She emphasized the complexity and opacity of the money system, which fuels political polarization and distracts people from focusing on the real issues. Those in power may want to divert attention from the money system, whilst corporate interests have an undue influence on government decisions. Let us now get into the video. Pay attention and be sure to drop your comments below. Enjoy. One way I'd phrase it right now is that we're kind of seeing the failure of incrementalism. So a lot of people, the way they they engage politics, they think if we just get like our person in charge, we can start turning this around. <laughs> and then that person, either well-intentioned or not, gets eaten by the machine and the machine just keeps going. And then people say, well, if we only get the next person in charge, we can turn this around. And so all these kind of like small measures are just going against basically the Borg of, of the bureaucracy of the system of, as things are designed. And historically, you tend to see kind of like things go on and on and on and on, and then a gigantic trend change. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really matters what the culture of the society is, because that's when you can get either very virtuous outcomes or horrific outcomes. And the way I would describe it is that when you look at, like I approach financial systems in the way that I approach systems engineering, like uh, as though I'm analyzing a complex system, because that's what we're doing. And there's st stable systems and unstable systems or marginally stable systems. And the financial system has all of the traits of an unstable system in the sense that for decades and decades, you have rising debt percentage of GDP, falling interest rates, which allows you to pay for those rising debts, even though you're getting rising debts. Basically, the interest expense is not rising. And then when you have a gigantic debt bubble, when you hit zero rates and you start going sideways to up in interest rates while you still have that very large public debt burden, that's when a lot of the things that keep getting there, that, you know, you kick the can down the road over and mm. over again, that's when it starts to materialize in the present. And that's when you look around and wonder like, why is none of this working anymore? Why is this, you know, why is this getting increasingly bad? It's because we've kind of extended the system as far as it can go. Out of bullets. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're out of bullets. And now we're kind of dealing with the consequences of a system that always, you know, for the past, say, four plus decades or more, was always unstable. But that could be delayed, deferred, pushed onto someone else, often in the developing world, Yeah, kind of push mm -hmm. that. But now a lot of these things are starting to hit in the present. Um, so we're there right now. Yeah, I think we've been there really since the global financial crisis. I think this is... um. I think this is a multi-step process. That's one thing I cover in my work is that basically these things historically, at least with the data we have and logically tend to go in two phases. You have kind of the private debt bubble blows up and then the response almost inevitably, not every time, but almost inevitably is to push that onto the public level. So you bail out the system, you bring all that debt or a lot of the debt onto the public level, some, some part of the private sector deleverage, and then the public debt part keeps building. And then the second hit is when the public debt bubble starts to have a problem. And I think that's that's the phase that we're in now. And that's still a multi-year process playing out. I would say one is that the more connected the world is, um, the more it's going to be a worldwide issue versus local issues. Um, you know, people that have seen the podcast before probably know that I often compare the 2010s to the 1930s and the yeah. 2020s to the 1940s. So there are a lot of elements back then. What's What's new this time is that most of these kind of long-term debt cycle or institutional cleansing cycle things that we go through, fourth turning, whatever you want to call it, usually there's a changeover in the type of money we use. You go from, say, free banking to central banking uh, with a gold underlay. Then you go to uh, another central banking model. We don't even have a gold underlay anymore. And what we've never done before is go through one of these cycles when we were fiat currency going into it. So what comes out? Right? Do we've we've never gone in this gigantic fiat currency global cycle, have a whole sovereign debt crisis on a global scale, <laughs> and then see what's on the other side of that? That's new. The total amount of debt owed by the U.S. government is skyrocketing. The Treasury's fiscal data platform shows 106.12 billion dollars has been piled onto America's debt in the seven days ending on October 18th. After crossing the 33 trillion dollars mark on September 15th, total outstanding US debt now stands at 33.62 trillion dollars, an increase of about 17.71 billion dollars per day. 
In a new interview with Bloomberg TV, Rockefeller Capital CEO Greg Fleming says he's concerned about the rising debt burden and the impact that America's interest payments will have on growth. Let's now hear what Lynn Alden has to say about the rising U.S. debt, inflation, and recession debate. It's not even just hyperinflation that can do it. It's, it's the perception of the loss of control. Right. And so, for example, there are a lot of developing countries today where they're not in, say, outright hyperinflation. Yeah. They might just have double-digit inflation on a recurring, regular basis. It's like a background part of life. Mm. Um, and there's no expectation that they're going to get it under control. And that's that's kind of the world. That That's historically a developing market phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And you can get that kind of situation in um, the developed world if this is left unchecked. I think that's kind of on the train we're going for is that you can call for kind of a central bank losing control in the sense that there's there becomes no clear way where they can get it back down to their, you know, their kind of prior baseline of money supply growth and price level changes and things like that, where there's too much public debt for them to tighten the way they want to. And then the, the challenge is that when you have a lot of public debt, interest rates start losing their effect. Um, they become more complicated tools to try to slow down inflation um, compared to when you have lower public debt levels and higher private debt levels. Um, and so when I get questions on hyperinflation stuff, I kind of put that aside and I say, we don't have to be there for this to be a problem. Like if you look at right now, the market still generally thinks the Fed can get the current situation under control. And maybe for a few years they can, right? It's, you know, you can cyclically get it under control potentially. Um, so right now, whenever you see kind of a higher inflation print than expected, you'll see the dollar strengthen and you'll see other, you know, because they say, well, now the Fed's got to get even tighter, right? Because they're, they're, they're going to get this, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's the current kind of market reaction for how this is going. And when you go through the looking glass is when the market realizes they actually don't have control. Right. And it, we're not there yet, but I think we're on this kind of either multi-month or probably more realistically multi-year process of, of getting to that point. Within the 2020s, I think. Um, next next few years, perhaps, um, I think that what I look for is the ingredients that can lead to that. And I, and I then judge the probability that those ingredients are building. So one would be energy security. Yeah, um, That's obviously in a dangerous spot right now. Um, and sometimes the problem goes away, but the structural issue is still there. Mm -hmm. So one would be energy security. And then the other one would be looking at the size of deficits, wondering how they're going to be financed, looking for any attempts to kind of improve the deficits, and then looking at the overall public debt to GDP ratios, because that's an indicator. 135%. Exactly. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And that's an indicator that starts to become relevant because when you get to that very high level and you raise rates, at the same time as you're pushing down the private sector by raising those rates, you're also greatly increasing the deficits. Um, and so if you imagine two numbers, if you imagine the U.S. in the 1970s, you know, the U.S. had 30% debt to GDP and most of the um, money creation was happening in the, in the private sector, not all of it, but a lot of it. And mm -hmm. um, when, so when Volcker raised rates very high in that period, um, it did two things. One, it slowed down bank lending because now it's a much higher hurdle rate to borrow, but also would increase the deficit to some extent because you know, you're paying higher interest on your debt. But because that was so small, the negative impact on the private sector was much larger, meaning that those rate hikes were disinflationary. The problem is if you fast forward, let's even go past the current, let's go to Japan. If you have 250% debt to GDP and you have pretty slow bank lending, almost all the money creation is really coming from the government deficits, the monetization mm. of those deficits. And so if you raise rates, you actually risk accelerating money supply growth because when you raise rates, the public interest expense will balloon significantly because you're doing it from a 250% debt to GDP base, whereas you're not going to impact private sector lending much because that's already small relative to that. So huh. that's the problem is that as you get more and more debt on the public level, interest rates become a more mixed tool for addressing inflation and eventually can become literally a like a, a negative tool for dealing with it. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said on Thursday, October 19, that inflation in the U.S. remains too high and bringing it down to the Fed's 2% target level will likely require a slower growing economy and job market. Powell's remarks appeared to push back against market expectations that the rate hikes by the U.S. central bank had reached an end. 
We are attentive to recent data showing the resilience of economic growth and demand for labor. Additional evidence of persistently above-trend growth or that tightness in the labor market is no longer easing could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of monetary policy, Powell said in remarks to the Economic Club of New York. Powell underscored the lingering theme at the U.S. Central Bank and explained that despite steady progress on lowering inflation, the battle in the U.S. is not over and further rate hikes are still a possibility with the duration of tight monetary conditions yet to be determined. Inflation is still too high and a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal, Powell said, citing the progress made since inflation peaked last year. The Fed's preferred measure of price changes eased to 3.5% in September compared with 12 months earlier, down sharply from a year-over-year -year peak of 7% in June 2022. We cannot yet know how long these lower readings will persist or where inflation will settle over coming quarters, Powell said. The path is likely to be bumpy and take some time. My colleagues and I are united in our commitment to bringing inflation down sustainably to 2%, said the Fed chair. The U.S. Federal Reserve announced its last interest rate decision on September 21 after a two-day Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, meeting and left the benchmark interest rates unchanged at 5.25% to 5.50%. Last month, Fed officials predicted that they would impose one more interest rate hike before the end of the year, on top of a series of 11 rate increases that have lifted their key rate to about 5.4%, its highest level in 22 years. In light of the latest Israel-Hamas war, Powell also noted several fresh uncertainties and geopolitical risks that need to be accounted for as the Fed tries to balance the threat of allowing inflation to rekindle against the threat of leaning on the economy more than is necessary. What do you think of Lynn Alden's take on these topics? Let us know in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.